girls there, um, or to experience and enjoy lovingly. Uh, uh, so we'll we'll start on the applied crypto section. Um, there's some snacks over there. Feel free to grab them whenever you want. Um, and Miriam, will will start. Feel free to criticize this paper a lot. Miriam's <laughs> doing her proposal on this talk in like two weeks, and is my student. So let's let's get all the ammunition out now. <laughs> and now that I've terrified her, <laughs> let's leave Miriam alone. She'll do great. Okay. Okay, hi everyone. This talk is about prox code, which is efficient biometric proximity searchable encryption from error correcting codes. And uh, throughout this talk, first we are going to talk about motivation and the goal of proximity search. Then we are going to talk about some definitions that are essential for understanding the rest of the talk. And then we are going to a naive uh, scheme that addresses the uh, question of proximity search, which here we call it baseline scheme. And we explore its drawbacks. And then uh, we see what we need to do to uh, reach an accurate search. And we talk about our approach and the result we got from it. Uh, so biometrics such as iris, face, voice recognition, fingerprints, and so on are used for uh, identification and authentication purposes. And they are usually deployed without cryptographic protection. And um, since, um, since mm, their nature, they are not like our passwords. So if, um, if the mm, biometric database gets compromised, uh, then you cannot change, for example, your iris or fingerprints as easy as you can change your password. Uh, one property of biometric readings is that they are noisy, so uh, meaning that environmental situation can um, affect uh, the readings of the biometrics. So the one that we sort in the database might be different from the further readings that we are going to compare them to the initial reading. Uh, here, uh, we define closed readings uh, if the biometrics are belongs to the same person. So for example, in the picture that we see, uh, the, part of, uh, the part of the eyelid has uh, covered the, uh, the iris and it resulted in different reading. Or maybe uh, the iris has moved or we have different lighting or the next time, for example, the uh, accuracy of the camera that recorded the further reading might be different than the initial one. On the other hand, we, may ha we have the far readings, which means those readings are belongs to different people, so they should have different, uh, completely different uh, string representation. Um, and the goal of biometric proximity search is that if further readings of a biometric, which we call query, are close to the database record, those records uh, should be returned. And when we are talking about far and close, the metric that we are using is a Hamming distance. And Hamming distance counts the number of places in the strings that, that are different. So for example, in this example that we see, uh, the string X and X, uh, string Y differ in only one uh, place, so their Hamming distance is one. And when we are defining closer strings, uh, we mean that their Hamming distance should be uh, less than a threshold T. And uh, when we are defining far strings, we mean that their Hamming distance should be uh, at least c times that uh, threshold t, which c should be some value greater than 1. So as I said, the goal of the biometric search is to return any record in the database that is within the, some threshold distance of the uh, queried value. Uh, in order to uh, have an accurate searchable encryption, uh, we need this result set to have the size of at most one. So what we mean by that is that if a person query their iris to an iris data set, he only 
turns back the record that belongs to himself, not anyone else. Uh, in uh, in other hand, uh, in an inaccurate system, if someone uh, queries some iris data to the data set, he might get um, some readings that are not close to the uh, queried values. And the problem with that is that someone can identify themselves as someone else. Uh, now let's have some uh, definitions that we are going to need for the rest of the talk. Uh, the first one is the approximate proximity search scheme. Um, the same as other search scheme, uh, it includes two uh, algorithms, setup and search. During setup, we have a data owner who owns a biometric database and would encrypt it and send it to the server. And later, during a search, we have a client who is given a token, and using that token, he would generate their query and query the data set, uh, query the server, um, his intended uh, biometric value, and the server would turn back uh, a result set. Um, the proximity search scheme is correct if this uh, set J contains the closest value to the queried value Y. Uh, the next notion that we are defining are defining our LSHs. LSHs or locality sensitive hashes are a family of hash functions that uh, map close items to the same hash value more frequently that they map far items to the same value. So if X and Y are close, then the probability of them having the same hash value should be greater than some epsilon t. And if x and y are far, then the probability of them having uh, same hash value should be less than some epsilon f. And we have defined, defined that epsilon t should always be uh, strictly greater than epsilon f. As an example, uh, let's uh, assume we have five LSH functions and, um, <clears throat> sorry, we have uh, three biometric readings, y, x2, and x3. Um, for y and x2, which uh, clearly are um, within the threshold distance of each other, so they seem close enough, uh, four out of five LSHs have the same evaluation on them. So they are black, black, white, white, black, black, and white, white. Only LSH4 has different uh, evaluation over them. While for the third uh, biometric reading, which is completely different from the other two, uh, it has completely different LSH evaluation with Y and uh, different, different LSH evaluation in four places out of five with X2. Um, the other uh, notion that uh, we need is multimaps. Multimaps are a data structures that uh, have two operations. Uh, first, we have a function add that they add the key value pair to the data structure. And later, when we are inputting key, we uh, get back all the values that are associated with the given key. And as you see, uh, multimaps are uh, have the one to many relationship. Uh, now let's see how the baseline scheme works. So in a naive scheme, one can insert a key value pair of LSH evaluation of each um, biometric reading along with the position of that reading in the data set to the multimap. So here for um, biometric X1, we have the LSH evaluation over X1 and uh, along with the index one in the multimap and LSH2 evaluation over X1 along with, it, with the position and so on. And we do it for all the records. Then in a, later in a search phase, uh, when a query Y is given, uh, the system turns back all the positions of the records that have at least uh, one LSH evaluation in common with the uh, LSH evaluation of the query. So it's, it's like 
if they're if they are common in LSH1 or if they are common in LSH2 or if they are common in LSH3 and so on. So it's a disjunctive uh, query. Uh, the drawback of this scheme is that construction of zero leakage multimaps is a challenge. Actually, uh, it is proven that uh, multimaps can at most be volume hiding, but they always leak the query equality pattern. And uh, the other thing is that to reach the reasonable accuracy that we talked about, the number of LSHs, which here we call n, should be very large, and large means in uh, order of millions. So in order to solve this, uh, and, and by solving, I mean to have an accurate search, which is uh, only returning the records that are close enough to the query, and um, lowering the probability of the LSH values be repeated. So uh, we are going to have uh, most, only or mostly one record that have same LSH ev evaluation along, for each record. Uh, we are going to transform our disjunctive uh, query form to k out of n query form. And uh, the other, so in this case, we are going to move to using map instead of multi-maps. And maps are the data structures that have the same functionality as multi-maps. They have insert that insert the key value pair to the data structure and have retrieve, which upon receiving the key, they turn back the associated value, but they are one-to-one. -one. So how we are doing this is that we are going to using uh, we are going to use the coding property of secret sharing schemes to ensure that we are going to associate just a single value to each LSH evaluation and uh, the way we are doing it is that for example imagine xi is a biometric um, reading, we are going to get the position i and encoding using some error correcting scheme and get the code word ci. Then we are going to split ci's as uh, the way we are going to do it is to split the code word symbols and then we are going to associate each code word symbol to one LSH. So here we need a code of size n and we are going to associate each of these n code word symbol to one of our n LSHs. And we are going to put this key value pair to our, um, to our data set. And later during the search, if k out of this n LSH evaluation are in common with our query, we are going to um, <clears throat> return that record. So we have implemented this construction and we have tested it on uh, random and real data. The, the real data that we have used is the IATD data set, which contains the iris data of two, uh, 24 people. And the result we have get um, is this. So uh, the best true accept rate that we received was 89%. And um, with the uh, delta far, which is the probability of uh, the, which is the fraction of the database that are incorrectly returned uh, with delta far of zero. Here, alpha is the size of the LSHs that we were using, and is the size of the LSH is the number of LSHs, and k is the number of matches we needed to make sure that we have chosen the closest item from the database, from the query. And thank you. Um, I have a two part question. For the secret sharing, is it threshold or like, yeah, so uh, the way we are using a Reed-Solomon uh, error correcting code, 
And uh, so the minimum distance of Red Solomon codes are n minus k minus, minus the number of erasure places over 2. So that is our threshold for um, the, number of play, the number of errors that we can correct. Okay. My second question was, how, do you, how did you pick the threshold? So that answered my question. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, that was a great talk. I just had a, like you might have mentioned this, and I might have just missed it, but I was curious um, whether you have a uh, comparison to other schemes, or is this like sort of like the first sort of doing this and it didn't make sense for there to be a comparison? So uh, basically, uh, our construction, so there are other zero leakage system, and um, if, um, the comparison we made was in the paper was mostly uh, compared to the baseline scheme, and uh, but this scheme can sit on top of any zero leakage map to uh, you know um, improve the efficiency. Um, so my question is. Uh, you're using iris scans as your example and data set in this case. Um, <clears throat> how much of this is tailored that would only work for, for that biometric and how much of this would be easy to apply to something completely different like a uh, handprint or something? So the data uh, I was using on was feature extracted. I'm not sure how the person who, were, um, who was um, preparing that data could you know, extract the vectors that I was working on on other uh, biometrics. So, um, so if I understand correctly, you're saying that there was a, a pre-processing stage that dealt yes. with the error correcting, and the, the, the putting this in the right format for biometric use, and maybe you'd be able to apply that kind of data no matter where it came from. Yeah, just that. Uh, so when we are when we were computing these parameters, we had this um, assumption that the uh, data set should be well spread. That's how we did the uh, computation for the random data and then we tuned it for the real data. So for any other biometrics, it should be to, up to some extent to uh, follow that distribution. Um, so I'm Sam. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Sam. I'm uh, currently a PhD student at the University of Florida, um, but I'm a UConn alumni. It's uh, nice to be back in Connecticut, see a bunch of familiar faces. And uh, today I'll be talking about analyzing data structures uh, through a provable security uh, paradigm. That's right. Uh, data structures, most generally, are a way to enforce a representation on possibly dynamic multisets and describe the functionalities that are allowed on those representations. And you know, space and time efficient data structures are a necessary ingredient for space and time efficient algorithms. So most research on data structures usually focuses on this, the efficiency and their possible applications without any regard for security or even really considerations of notions for security. And for the most part, this is sensible, right? Because Notions of security for data structures are not a really natural thing. And for the most part, most commonly used data structures are not only completely deterministic in their operations, but also their representations of uh, the underlying data. So let's uh, constrain ourselves for a moment and just talk about data structures that impose some notion of randomness on the representations of data. Right? So the familiar hash table, right? it randomly distributes data into buckets by using you know, a choice of hash function. Right, skip lists, randomly partition data to optimize search. Then bloom filters and the like compress data in some random way by using a collection of hash functions to take a set of data and hash it to certain positions in small arrays. Um, and this randomness right, is used for efficiency gain, whether it be space or time or some combination thereof. But let's ask ourselves a question, what happens to these these nice gains you get, or these nice guarantees you get, in the average case, or even in the worst case, 
when you let the adversary you let an adversary control some portion of the data being um, represented by these structures. And we'll start with a motivating uh, example of adversarial hash tables. All right, uh, so actually the, these attacks, which are now called hash flood DOS attacks, have been around in the literature for over two decades, and they're, they're quite conceptually simple, right? You just find a collection of data, endpoints of data, such that they all hash to the same bucket, right? And we have O of 1 expected time on insertions in hash tables. So if you insert n elements, your average case would be O of n, but with this attack, you guarantee that your average case is now quadratic. And um, this, this attack actually has detrimental effects in this in the real world, this simple attack, um, the original paper by Crosby and Wallach showed that they could cause the Bro network monitoring tool to basically drop all traffic for long periods of time just by doing this. And then more recently, still about 10 years ago, at Black Hat, um, two researchers showed that just by sending one carefully, H carefully crafted HTTP request to uh, web servers written in like many of the common programming languages like Perl, uh, .NET, Java, that they could cause the web server to use 99% of its CPU for prolonged periods of time. So these simple attacks do matter. <laughs> it's kind of the upshot. And really, the upshot of the attack is just that the most commonly used non crypto of hash functions, they're weak. It's really easy to, I mean, it's like not even like a brute force attack. These, these things are structurally weak, such that you can always find collisions like almost in constant time. Um, I mean, these things are highly performant, but not secure, thus leading yourself to, to these types of attacks. And so the solution, the proposed solution, the one that seemed to work and be adopted, was that you just switch the hash functions for a keyed primitive like a PRF, uh, specifically SIP hash due to Bernstein, um, is performant enough, only a, a slight uh, trade-off in terms of performance for like these non cryptographic um, hash functions, and uh, you know many Many of these web servers that were affected upgraded to this behind the scenes and didn't seem like we needed to worry about this anymore. But, you know, as a cryptographer, I'm asking the question, well, where's the formalization of this? Where's the proof? Like, can we formalize this attack? Can we formalize an attack model to talk about these things, formalize a security model, and prove security of this simple swapped hash to PRF construction? And it turns out in the literature that this, uh, at least as far as I can tell, hasn't been done. So this observation motivates um, this work that I've been working on and also work from the PDS, Probabilistic Data Structure Security, for a need for like a loose, at least a loose heuristic on the provable security of data structures. So let's talk about this kind of generally. Uh, it's a loose framework because it's not really a, a framework. It's more of a heuristic, a loose set of suggestions on how to tackle these sorts of problems. And the thing we really demand is a data structure's first view. So that means we demand that we treat data structures as a primitive in and of themselves and ascribe security properties specifically to the data structure rather than some like abstract protocol using the data structure, right? So the way we go about this is we you know, select a general syntax to describe a whole bunch of data structures. I'm partial to the one from uh, Clayton et al. that you know, just describes data structures simply through three operations and then some analysis around it. But, a representation which initializes a data structure, updates to process updates, and queries to process queries. And then, um, you know, you might need to modify or add to this, data to this syntax if you want to support, like, data structures that require, like, some sort of key generation or verification for, like, authenticated data structures, but it's not that hard to do. And then you can instantiate concrete instructions for these data structures by algorithmically defining the functionalities of these specific syntactic properties. And then if you want to narrow your view, right, you can define like subclasses of interest through like properties of the data structure, right? Like, so you can say like a definitive property of a set membership data structure, it must support this query type and respond in such and such a way. And really, like, again, we don't like enforce a way to prove security or force a way to show security. So it's a really flexible security notion. And there's been a lot of ways to do this in the literature. So you just, the real core is, again, we want to describe security properties in terms of the data structure. So we define security properties and experiments, excuse me, with respect and with respect to the syntax and functionality of the data structure. So when you talk about a security property, it's within reference to like the operation of the algorithms that the data structure performs or like query responses. 
And you know, you can do this in a game-based way, a simulation style way. There's a couple approaches to this in the body of the PDS security work. Talk about them. And then uh, you know, we have a simple computational model. We just parameterize your adversary in terms of like number of calls to these data structures. You, you know, you can make them oracles and then just say like a one update is one call to up, and then you give them concrete number of times they can call these uh, oracles and then you know also over the running time. Then it's an addendum. What we really want from this work, focusing on these types of data structures, applicability. You want to take like an off-the-shelf data structure, do some simple transformation, and then get out an adversarially robust data structure with respect to the off-the-shelf guarantees. So like if you have a bloom filter, it has a very well-defined non-adversarial uh, correctness bound. You want to do some simple transformation, then you want to say, just do this, and now even if you deploy your bloom filter in an adversarial setting, that bound is more or less preserved. So where this work has really caught caught on is, is in the probabilistic data structures community. So what probabilistic data structures are, is they compactly represent a collection of data. And um, they can provide uh, very quick answers in a small amount of space. But as a trade-off, right, they only provide approximately correct answers to queries about the data, as opposed to like computing the answer over a whole collection. You know, there's many types like uh, Compact frequency estimators, uh, membership queries, Bloom filter is probably the most well known. If you're not in this space, and then cardinality estimators. And right, so as I said, uh, or as alluded to, most of these data structures have like well defined bounds on their response error. So like this could be the false positive rate for a Bloom filter. Right, there are no false negatives in a Bloom filter, but the uh, Bloom filter does have a false positive rate, which is bounded by the size of the collection you're representing and the dimensions of the Bloom filter and the number of hash functions used. You have an overestimation bound for the count and sketch, so how far off your frequency estimation is from the true frequency estimation. But all these bounds are computed strictly in a non-adaptive manner. That means that the data that they collect does not depend on the internal randomness of the structure, um, which of course an adversary might not adhere to, and just to set the stage for why this is important, it's because, well, these things are used all over the place and in many instances where there is adversarial incentive to mess with these things. So like, you know, in high frequency trading systems and network monitoring systems and uh, certificate revocation systems like in CRL Lite and, uh, you know, any other such use cases you can come up with. So, of course, we ask the question, well, what happens to these correctness guarantees in the presence of an adversary that can control some or all the portion of the stream of data being processed by one of these structures. And there's been a number of papers on this, kicking off with uh, Noori and Yegev in 2015, and then building, building, building. And all of these structures, you know, multiple different structures have been analyzed through a number of security styles. And largely, the um, result has been that uh, use the standard hash functions, right? Uh, these structures, again, in general, what they do is they process some data through some hash functions, and then update some blocks in a small array-like structure that keeps a compact summary and allows you to answer these queries approximately. Uh, you can just create large correctness errors with very minimal adversarial resources. But the, the, the key is that um, with an easy swap to a key primitive, like you swap the hash functions for PRFs, you get, in general, adversary, adversarially robust structures in terms of that you retain a correctness bound close to the non-adaptive bound. And just to say a little about this game-based versus simulation-style proofs, so these game-based proofs for the Bloom filter, you generally define a game where the adversary needs to like find a false positive after a bounded number of sequences of queries and insertions. Um, or for the count and sketch, uh, create an element that has so much um, um, frequency estimation error. And the simulation style proofs generally compared to an ideal functionality in which you replace the adversary's insertions with the random insertions into the structure of interest. And this is because you don't want to replace the ideal functionality with like a real cardinality estimator because you can't compare between the allowable error of the probabilistic data structure and the error caused by the adversary. Um, but we'll just uh, motivate this with a case study on the Countman sketch, which is a compact frequency estimator. It's based off of work that my co-authors and I just presented at uh, CCS this past uh, November. Um, so the Countman sketch is like the most widely used compact frequency estimator. It's a simple structure of m columns and k rows. Uh, there's count, they're, they're 2D arrays of counters. I'll initialize a zero associated with each row. It's a hash function selected from a uh, pairwise independent hash family. 
And insertions are really simple. You just run x through the three hash functions, get out its positions, and add one at those positions. Querying is also simple, right? You um, run x again through its hash functions, add its positions, and then return the minimum counter over all of its uh, counters in each row. And uh, the guarantees are that common sketch can never uh, underestimate. And in the non-adaptive setting, you have a bound that uh, overestimation bound that only depends on the length of the stream and the parameters of the structure. Um, so we introduced a error model for these compact frequency estimators, and it's, it's pretty simple. Um, so you get a, a, the start of the experiment, right? You uh, select a target x from the universe, so that is provided to the adversary. The adversary doesn't choose a target, uh, so it makes the adversary's job harder. Uh, you get an empty structure, and then the adversary also possibly gets a key. So, you know, we already built in like the key swap. We just leak the key to simulate the normal hash functions. Uh, and then you get an insert, query, and reveal structure. Reveal, we sometimes set this to zero if we want to black box the structure, but it allows you to see the internal counters of the structure. And then you get access to like a hash oracle that we model in the ROM. So, yep. And then the goal of the adversary is to make any number of sequences of these queries. And then at the end, they want to maximize the CMS error on X such that the query of X is much greater than the true frequency of X. And the attack is quite simple in the pu public hash setting. Uh, so this is like where, you know, you can just compute the hash functions in the ROM and kind of brute force what we call a cover set. So the goal is just to find a set of items, one per each row, that collide with X's counter in each row. Uh, you find the set and then just insert it as many times as your resources allow you to. And your, the error you induce is just the number of insertions over that size of that cover set. Um, right. And you know we tried the usual mitigation of, OK, take these hash functions, swap them for a key primitive. And it didn't work, actually, which was surprising. Um, so we found attacks that just cause massive error, even when swapping the hash functions for PRFs and setting the reveal budget to zero, essentially black boxing the structure. It turns out that the query oracle leaks too much information, and you can find these cover sets just from the um, from, from from the responses of the, the structure. Um, so this was slightly surprising and somewhat disappointing. Uh, so we couldn't obviously prove security for any of these uh, comeback frequency estimators because we had these results generalized. But so we did the best we could, and we introduced a new structure. It's a hybrid structure of two different compact frequency estimators. It can detect these attacks, but not prevent them. It seems to work well in practice. But obviously, that's not very satisfying for us. So our next step forward is to redefine the problem. Um, so Kevin Sketch and friends are mostly not used. You don't really care about the frequency estimate of any element in the universe. You really only care about the most frequent elements in a particular data collection. Uh, this is usually called like the top K or heavy hitters problem in the literature. Um, so what we want to do is define a security notion for this problem, and then see if we can find an adversarially robust structure through very simple changes to the base structures that satisfy a security notion like this. And uh, one last thing that I don't think I'll have too much time to talk about, only one slide on it, is applying the same kind of reasoning to uh, what I call or what we call cryptographic data structures, and these are structures defined in the literature, mostly in the theoretical cryptography literature, that have very stringent and strong security properties built in. Uh, you can think of things like oblivious structures, uh, authenticated data structures, and zero-knowledge sets. Right? Um, and analyzing these from like a um, data structure's first perspective, rather than like ascribing some protocol to them with players playing certain roles and just using this data structure in a certain way, you know, it has some advantages. Namely, you can ask fun questions like, what does it mean to have a compact, verifiable data structure? Or what advantages can you get from only obliviating like, certain structures with small limited query spaces rather than like, trying to do something big like the ORAM model and generically obliviate computation? And also, as like, a real-world motivating example, right? Uh, Zero-knowledge sets have existed in the theoretical cryptography literature for Again, like about two decades and now, they're uh, coming into fruition because of the uh, because of key transparency systems and these verifiable key directories. So, one thing there is that the way they're presented in the literature is a bit of a mismatch. It's like presented as like a two prover, one verifier protocol. 
where in these verifiable key directory systems, that isn't exactly the parties that are involved. And lastly, I just wanted to thank my co-authors and colleagues, uh, Advisor Tom and uh, really cool folks from ETH, uh, Kenny, Hia, and Anu, uh, soon to be co-authors or current co-authors. And uh, thank you. Hi, great talk, by the way. So uh, when you say that you're replacing the uh, hash functions with the PRF, mm -hmm. so in your framework, you also captured the notion of indistinguishability for the PRFs? Uh, yeah, yeah. So right, uh, that generally comes up in the uh, security bound somewhere, right? Okay. Like the PRF switch uh, comes up in like the either whatever you're doing, the simulation or the game-based notion. Um, great talk, by the way. Um, how exactly is your framework working with a PRF? Like, does it compose <laughs> or does it compose? As in, like, P like the PR like PRFs have been proven to be secure, right? And whatever in both the game based model and I think UC. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe UC. I don't know the full details, but whatever. It's been it's been it's been proven secure in like one of the models. Um, like it maybe compose is not the right question, but is it does does it just like is it like fine to take a, a something that was proven in a different model, place it into your like your framework for um, data structures, and claim that it's it holds the properties that it's supposed to? Oh. Um yeah, I guess, I guess I see, maybe see the question. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I didn't really formally present the syntax, but we allow like those, that those, the syntax of data structures, kind of a views notation and allow it to take the parameterized by a secret key. So it kind of just natively accepts a key. And then, right, I mean, you might have to worry about like a PRF switch in some constructions where you actually expect like a pseudo random permutation or something. But um, for the most part, it, it's fine, right? Like. Uh, generally expect that the properties we need from the hash functions for these structures are the same as those for the PRF. Hello. Um, is CPRF considered a PRF? And if so, is it better than AES in some ways? Um, I'm an applied cryptographer, but not that applied of a cryptographer. So <laughs> probably not the best person to ask. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, hi, uh, I'm Nicholas Al Haddad, a PhD student at Boston University, and I will be talking today about Haven Plus uh, Plus, a batched and packed dual threshold asynchronous complete secret sharing. Uh, this work has been done with Myang Vaya and uh, Zilin Yang. So, what is asynchronous complete uh, secret sharing, or ACSS? Uh, it's a protocol that allows a dealer uh, that to distribute shares of some secret to end parties. Uh, the parties need to talk together, need to agree that indeed the shares are consistent with the same secret, such that any T plus one parties can reconstruct uh, the secret. So this means that every party needs to have a share. And this must be done even in the presence of T malicious parties that can lie. So in this work, we are going to focus on the n is equal to 3t plus 1 setting. So around a third of the parties could be malicious. The protocol is also in the asynchronous setting. So the attacker can delay messages arbitrarily between any two honest parties. And there are no reliable failure detectors. So an honest party cannot differentiate between a slow party and a malicious party that didn't send anything. For the people in the audience that know AVSS, the difference here is that any T plus one honest parties can reconstruct the secret, while in AVSS, at least T plus one honest parties can reconstruct the secret. The difference is in the quantifier. Um, so we present Haven plus plus. It can be considered a low threshold ACSS. Haven plus plus is optimal along different dimensions. The protocol has optimal amortized word complexity of, of KN, where K is the security parameter. And uh, you can think of word complexity as communication in complexity that ignores lock factors. Uh, so the amortization kicks in when sharing all event secrets. Um, Haven++ does not have a, any PKI or trust setup, and the protocol has optimal number of rounds of just three. 
As for the crypto cryptographic assumptions, uh, we rely on the random oracle model and the hardness of discrete log. Um, so why ACSS is hard? Well, uh, consensus is hard, and especially in asynchrony. Um, so uh, and also requiring everyone to have shares in the presence of a malicious dealer also doesn't help. So to appreciate the hardness of the problem, I'm going to give you an example. We, I will break the parties into three groups, a group of T plus one honest parties, um, and two other groups of T parties where one is malicious and the other is honest. Um, um, so um, I'm going to give you two worlds. Uh, in one world, um, we will have a malicious uh, dealer uh, colluding with T minus one other bad parties. Um, so uh, they are communicating faithfully with T plus one honest parties. Um, however, the bad dealer and the, the malicious uh, parties will not send any information to the other T honest parties. I put dashed lines for you to see that they are not sending anything to the T uh, honest parties. So in the other world, world number two, uh, we will have an honest dealer that will send good shares to everyone, but T bad, uh, T -bad parties are present among the N parties. Um, and the T bad parties will not send anything to the T plus one honest parties. Uh, so I want you to focus on the T plus one honest parties view. And um, 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 in word number one, they shouldn't finish the ACSS because their friends don't have shares. But in word number two, they should finish because all honest parties have shares. So in, in both cases, they're going to be complaining. We got no shares. Uh, don't finish the dispersal. But in one scenario, they should. And in the other, they shouldn't. Okay, so. How can the T plus one honest parties know who to trust? How do they know whether the other T parties are lying about what the dealer sent? Well, there are two main ways to solve these problems, two main paradigms. The first way is to use some accusation and consensus, which usually involve relying on primitives such as verifiable information dispersal, but I'm not going to get into that. The second way is for the T plus one honest parties to send good shares to the other parties regardless uh, if they receive good shares or not. So Haven++ adopts the second solution. Um, so in Haven++, we use this uh, bivariate polynomial secret sharing structure that will allow any T plus one parties to send shares to any other T parties so that they don't get left uh, behind uh, without any shares. So um, I will show you how to do this with an example uh, with three secrets at the same time, S0, S1, and S2. Um, so we're going to generate five uniformly random uh, uh, degree t polynomials um, such that um, um, the first three univariate polynomials are going to be encoding uh, the secrets at 0. Um, and uh, we're going to evaluate those polynomials at seven points, as shown in the picture. And then we're going to interpolate row-wise to generate uh, evaluation points all over. Um, so uh, what's the idea here? Uh, so the idea is if we give three parties rows, then they will be able to reconstruct S0, S1, S2. But more importantly, they will be able to hand over shares to other parties. So for example, if you look at P4 here, uh, through the columns, if you, hand, you, if you hand them shares on the, on the columns, you can reconstruct the rows of P4. Um, OK, so uh, Haven++ has three phases. It has a dealing phase, echo phase, and a ready phase. Uh, we will go through them one by one. So in the dealing phase, the dealer sends every party a row polynomial of the bivariate polynomial, uh, but it will also send polynomial commitments to the columns um, and opening proofs to every party. Uh, the, this will prove that the points on the row polynomials are consistent with the column polynomials. So after the parties receive the dealing message, it's just a row. Um, and if the verification succeeds, then they, they, they go to the echo phase. And so they have to echo back what they heard from the dealer. So for example, party P4 will send party P1, hey, this is uh, your, uh, this is, uh, your point. Um, um, and it will also send it a, a proof. Uh, notice here that you know, row 4 at 1 is equal to column 1 at 4. So uh, it will repeat this for, every, for all parties. So P4 will send everybody, hey, this is a point on your column. Hey, this is a point on your column. So every party will receive a potential point on its column, and uh, every party will wait so that it hears uh, two t plus one columns. It cannot wait for everyone because you know t parties might be bad. So in this case, it cannot wait for the other two parties. They might not send anything, so they have to proceed without them. Once they have two t plus one, um, they can interpolate the column and they can generate the proofs. We are assuming here uh, 
a deterministic polynomial commitment. So they are now ready, so in this case before, is ready to move on to the ready phase. Uh, so in the ready phase, um, it has to send a point uh, on every person's row. It has it because it just interpolated it. Um, and uh, so once the party receive, uh, again, it cannot wait for everyone. So once it receives 2t plus 1 points on the row, it can, uh, uh, it can interpolate the shares of uh, S0, S1, and S2, and it's happy. Okay, now some of you might be concerned, you know, what if we don't receive 2t plus 1 points? Well, you have here two cases. Um, you might receive less than t plus 1. In that case, just ignore it because you have t bad parties. They can send you junk. Uh, but if you have more than t plus 1 parties, rest assured the information is on the way. Um, there is some honest party out there that heard more than t plus 1 uh, honest points coming to its column, and they're also heading towards everyone. Um, okay, so after the, the dispersal finishes, it's guaranteed that everybody, event if one honest party finishes a the dispersal, then every, everybody will. Everybody will have a column and a row, um, including here P4 has a, has a row and a column polynomial. Um, so to reconstruct the secrets, we have two options here. To reconstru we can reconstruct all the packed secrets, uh, S0, S1, and S2, by every party evaluating its own column polynomial at 0 and then handing that to the opening party. Or you can open individually S0, S1, and S2 by evaluating your rows and then uh, at, at the right places and then interpolating, uh, sending, the the, sending the points to the column polynomial to the opening party and you can evaluate it at 0 and uh, get the secrets. Um, okay, so uh, some of you might wonder, okay, this seems complicated, has polynomial commitments, proofs, whatever. It's not efficient. So we show here that uh, indeed Haven++ is efficient. Uh, we compare against HBACSS, another uh, ACSS that cho chose to do paradigm one. So it has accus accusations and consensus you know, to solve the problem of whether people lied or not. Um, so they have two different runtimes, whether, whether they have false or not false. You can see here, we uh, Haven++ beats HBSS with and without false by a factor of at least 3x. Uh, in here, there's batching. So we have batching of size three, uh, uh, batches of around two n secrets, um, six batches, but uh, we will not get into that because of time constraints. Um, but one notable thing about Haven++ is that as, as n increases, uh, you see the runtime is, is decreasing. Um, this is mainly due to the FFT is kicking in because we're using FFTs for polynomial evaluations and our optimized batching technique. Um, so there are many applications for Haven++. You have, uh, you can build a asynchronous serial key generation out of it, serial leader election, asynchronous multi-party computation in general. We will focus here about uh, on the serial key generation. Um, quickly, uh, ADKG allows a group of parties to have a public key whose secret key is shared among the parties without any single party knowing that secret key. So if you have less than t plus two parties that can reconstruct that secret key, we call it a low threshold ADKG. If it has more than t plus one parties that can reconstruct the secret key, we call it a high threshold ADKG. So we can build an ADKG out of Haven++. Uh, in this table, you can see that Haven++ enables uh, a low threshold ADKG with an optimal amortized word complexity of O of Kn um, when the batch size is uh, O of n without needing a trust setup uh, and uh, with the discrete log being hard and random oracle mob uh, as crypto assumptions. Haven++ also enables high threshold ADKG, but it has a slightly higher amortized word complexity of K, O of K n squared uh, when the batch size is open. So how do we get this? So, um, so every party would run a Haven++ uh, instance with t plus one secrets. So you can see here you have p1 up to p7. Everybody ran an, uh, uh, an instance of uh, Haven++. Um, and from those instances, we're going to build new bivariate polynomials uh, that will encode t plus one new, uh, each will encode t plus one new secrets. Um, so, um, so the parties have to agree among them who finished the, uh, the AVSS, who finished, sorry, who finished uh, the ACSS, who finished Haven++ instance. And from the ones that remain, uh, we're going to be building new bivariate polynomials uh, where every party is going to be giving you an, an, a column of this new bivariate uh, polynomial. So you can see here through the animation, we're going to take every column that is packed on the side, and we're going to use it to build a new bivariate polynomial. Um, and we can do this uh, for t plus 1 
t plus 1 times for every packed secret, and here we get t plus 1 new bivariate polynomials. Now, to get high threshold ADKG, we assume that we have only one secret key that is packed, and so um, we are guaranteed, we already have, we already finished the Haven++ instances, we, get, we have a guarantee that everyone has a row on this uh, new bivariate, but we don't have a guarantee that everybody has a column. So um, luckily for us, um, the other parties can help P6 and P7 reconstruct their column. Uh, so once they do reconstruct their column, you can interpolate column-wise, and you can get a high threshold ADKG uh, in the top row. Uh, to build a low threshold ADKG, uh, every party already has a row, uh, so you can just evaluate your your point at the right location, and you can get a share of the uh, of the secret key that you that correspond uh, a share of the secret key that you're interested in. Um, I haven't told you yet about uh, public keys, but you can easily generate those uh, public keys um, because we have consensus over the column polynomial commitments. So. Um, uh, so we can, uh, every party can just send a public key and prove that it is that is consistent with a specific polynomial commitment. Uh, I can discuss that offline if you're interested. Um, in the summary, uh, we built a dual threshold ACSS that is efficient and optimal in different aspects, optimal number of rounds, um, optimal amortized word complexity, no trusses setup, and we showed how to build the first low threshold ADKG with optimal amortized word complexity and the first high threshold ADKG with O of K and squared. We have an open problem. Uh, we're still thinking about it. Um, the question is, can we have an amortized high threshold ADKG with O of K n communication complexity without a trusses setup when n is equal to 3t plus 1? We know how to build it when n is equal to 4t plus 1, but this is, this is more interesting. Um, thank you. I'm happy to take questions now. While I'm walking to Moses, I'll ask my question. So can you just repeat the guarantee you want? You want if T plus one honest parties have completed, that everybody acknowledges they've completed? So um, so the, 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 uh, the ACSS requires that every party, um, so every party has a share, and any T plus one out of this N group of N parties can reconstruct the, sec uh, the, the secret. So usually with ABSS, you have like, there's at least T plus one honest parties out there that can reconstruct the secret and you're happy with it. But here we're saying, if one honest party finished, all honest parties must finish with shares that can be used to reconstruct the secret. Okay, so dumb follow-up question. But you, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. You, you have full adversarial network control, right? That's correct. So if an honest party is just completely like eclipsed from the network, so it's an asynchronous network. So we assume that if a message was sent to that honest party, eventually, we don't know when, okay. but eventually it will get through. But when, when it gets through, everything will be fine. So eventually the system, eventually everybody will receive issues. Um, OK, so uh, Ben actually covered part of my question. But the communication network, it's an asynchronous network. That's correct. Uh, we're assuming that eventual delivery will occur but uh, I believe you are assuming an authenticated channel? Yeah. Um, okay, so I just wanted to clarify because you talked about this being done without PKI. My understanding is that in some of the prior work, like PKI was used because they didn't want to assume an authenticated channel. So is this like... So authenticated channel doesn't necessarily... So we assume pairwise authenticated channels, right? So right. you can have a shared symmetric key uh, between them. Sure. But that That's doesn't... The that doesn't necessarily mean it's a PKI. So with a PKI, okay. you have a public key, um, a secret key, and that's you have like a map. You have consensus over who owns what public key, and it's it's a stronger form of consensus than pairwise uh, uh, pairwise authentication channels. So, so uh, certainly, I agree that PKI, like a PKI that you could use leverage for authentication, is one is a stronger model than just assuming that there's some pairwise secrets between uh, between endpoints, but. Uh, you were saying without trusted setup. And it seems to me that if you have pairwise shared keys, that is a trusted setup. Uh, and the only way that wouldn't be trusted setup is if you just assume it, it just exists. So so the, the type, maybe maybe I should be more clear about the type of trusted setup. So when I meant uh, trusted setup, I meant like stuff like KZG ceremony. You know, stuff that requires a lot of uh, 
requires some multi-party computation to, to happen. You know, so um, usually, you would, uh, the way around this is like you would have KCG, and because you have KCG, like the KCG ceremony, you can have uh, constant size uh, polynomial commitment proofs. And in here, we are not assuming that. We actually have like uh, our amortization kicks in and cover for the, for the log-based log uh, proofs for the polynomial commitments. Thank you very much. Awesome. <clears throat> take, take it away. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tolik. I'm a PhD student at Boston University. And I'll be talking about approximate lower bound arguments, or ALBA in short. And this is joint work with Piros Chaidas, Aguilas Kiaias, and Leo Raisin. So here's the problem we are trying to solve. Uh, we assume we have a prover who has in his possession a large number of data elements of interest. What do I mean by of interest? There is this predicate R that um, for each element tells if this element is interesting or not. So if this predicate R returns one, then the element is interesting, otherwise it's not. And the prover's goal is to convince the verifier that he knows more than enough elements of interest for which the predicate equals one. And one way to accomplish this is, of course, to send to the verifier nf plus one elements. But this is kind of inefficient if nf is a large number. But um, actually, we can do much better if we add an extra assumption. And it's that the prover knows NP elements of interest, where NP is much larger than NF. Um, and on a very high level, the way it will work is uh, the prover will send only some elements to the verifier that possess some special properties. <clears throat> and it's important to note that uh, the larger this ratio NP over NF is, the more efficiently we can accomplish this uh, problem. We can also slightly generalize this and add weights. So now each element will have some integer weight. Uh, we replace the predicate R with the weight function W that, re that returns um, for each element its weight. And our new goal is to convince the verifier that the prover knows enough elements of total weight exceeding NF. And now the new assumption is that the prover um, actually knows elements of enough elements of total weight NP. And we call this um, primitive approximate low bound argument all bound short. Uh, actually, this is a problem that has a somewhat long history. Uh, throughout the 80s, it has been implemented and used by uh, Sieb, Sergach, Baba, and Goldwasser in complexity theory. But their implementations um, all have interaction and large proofs. And on the other hand, our goal is to construct um, an ALBA primitive for real-world applications. So in particular, we want to minimize the proof size as much as possible, so we actually care about um, concrete numbers, not only the asymptotics. Uh, and we want non-interactivity, meaning we want the prover to uh, kind of simultaneously convince all present and future verifiers that he has enough elements. Uh, we also want fast prover and fast verifier. Uh, and we want to minimize communication in a setting where our data elements are kind of spread out across multiple distinct uh, provers that need to communicate. And finally, we want a property called extractability, or in other words, proof of knowledge, meaning um, we want to be able to say that if there is a prover that uh, makes valid proofs, then he, this prover must actually know enough data elements, meaning we can take this prover and extract from it enough data elements. Uh, here's how we define this primitive more precisely, in a random oracle model, the prover and the verifier have access 
Oracle access to the random Oracle H, first of all, and also the weight function W. And we have two standard properties, completeness and soundness. So the completeness just says that if a uh, prover has uh, elements of total weight NP, then he creates proofs that the verifier accepts. And the soundness is in terms of proof of knowledge. So we want to say that if a program A makes, makes valid proofs, then A actually knows elements of total weight more than NF. Um, for this, we create a program extract that has access to the program A, and this extract program must output those data elements. <clears throat> uh, here is our results. So we want completeness and soundness errors to be at most 2 to the minus lambda. And for simplicity, let's assume that NP is equal to 2 times NF, meaning um, the prover knows elements of total weight twice as large as the weight to be proven. And in that case, the proof size is only uh, lambda plus log lambda plus 6 elements, which is a constant in the input size, the number of elements. In particular, for 128-bit security, this is only 141 element. Um, and also, the prover's running time will be big O of n plus lambda squared hashings in expectation, and the verifier does only of lambda hashings. By hashing, I mean applying a, sim uh, a symmetric hash function, <clears throat> which, is, which is fast. So we identify two applications for this primitive. The first one is straight line witness extraction for SNARKs. Uh, as a reminder, I'll quickly re um, recall what the SNARK is. So it's a, it's a proof system where there is a prover and a verifier. The prover has some statement S and a witness W that satisfies the statement. And the verifier only has statement S. And the prover's goal is to uh, send a succinct message by to the verifier that will convince the verifier that the prover knows um, the right witness W for the statement S. And there have been, this is a very powerful primitive, and there have been many instantiations. <clears throat> In particular, uh, a recent work by Ganesh et al. constructs a snark in a universal composability model. Um, this framework is useful for composing protocols in a modular way. And, however, this, this framework has a number of requirements. In particular, it requires any knowledge extraction to happen without rewinding the prover, meaning you only run the prover once. But here's the problem. So if, if we want the, proof, the size of the proof pi to be succinct much smaller than the size of the witness w, how can you extract the whole witness if you only run the prover once? And the answer is it's possible in the random oracle model. So in the random oracle model, you can kind of, the extractor can kind of spy on the queries to the random oracle by the prover. And perhaps looking at all those queries to the random oracle model, you can reconstruct the whole witness. So this is what this work by Ganesh et al. Uh, does. It basically represents this, the witness W as some degree deep polynomial. And the prover commits to this polynomial using some polynomial commitment scheme. And then the prover proves to the verifier that he has queried the random oracle on d plus 1 valid points of the polynomial. And the way he does it, he queries more than that number of points, he queries lambda times d points. And one observation is that this is actually an application of this primitive ALBA. And using our scheme, the prover can accomplish the same thing by querying only 2 times d points, which makes the prover, the snark prover, approximately lambda times faster. And this also, this also gives us a more modular approach. Uh, we also uh, consider a decentralized setting where our data elements are spread out across multiple 
disjoint provers. So each prover has exactly one data element. And the provers communicate some messages to the aggregator, who will in turn construct one final proof pi that the verifier gets. And in addition to uh, the requirement that the proof pi is small and that all the programs prover, aggregator, and verifier are fast, we also want as few provers as possible to communicate at all. And here is the results uh, in this setting. So again, we want completeness and soundness errors to be at most 2 to the minus lambda. And we assume at p is equal to 2 times nf. In that case, the proof size is going to be lambda plus of square root of lambda data elements, which is not much larger than lambda. Uh, then the prover does only um, one hashing. The aggregator does of lambda squared hashings in expectation. And the verifier still does only all of lambda hashings. <clears throat> Finally, the communication complexity only all of lambda squared provers communicate, and each prover, each of those provers sent exactly one data element to the aggregator. Now this has applications, this has um, this is useful for application number two, which is weighted multi-signatures. For this problem, we want to convince the verifier that many parties sign the same message. And this, in particular, is uh, useful for proof of stake blockchains, where we want to convince a verifier, a light client, that uh, nodes with a large number of, a large amount of blockchain stake have attested to the same current blockchain state. So a common assumption in blockchains is that 80% um, of owner's stake belongs to owner's users, 20% of malicious stake belongs, uh, sorry, 20% of stake belongs to malicious users. Uh, so we can set NP over NF to be equal to four. And the protocol is as follows. Each node signs the current blockchain state and the nodes the weight of the node's signature will equal to the node's stake in the system. And then we aggregate the signatures using this decentralized ALBA scheme. And in summary, what we get is a small proof and small communication complexity, in particular um, for 128 bit security, only 23,000 nodes. Uh, send a signature, and the proof size is only 74 signatures. And I know I didn't go into the actual construction, how we, how we do this, how we implement this ALBA scheme, uh, but you can um, read about it in our paper on imprint. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Is the is the connection to like polynomial identity staying a coincidence, or is that like inherent? That like, well, maybe I should read the paper before asking this question. But it right is is the fact that you're replacing polynomial evaluations and arguing about like the degree of a polynomial. This question wasn't well formed in my head. So the, this is just for one application, right? This is right. application number one, right? So, so, so here what happens is um, the witness is, is, is assumed to be a DBD polynomial. Yeah. If the prover convinces the verifier that he queried the random oracle on D plus one valid points, then the verifier can interpolate the polynomial and reconstruct the whole witness. Um, but he needs to query more points than, than D plus one to construct a short proof that he queried d plus one points. I have another question, but it's not well formed, so I don't want to ask it in front of other people. There's a question. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> we 
Yeah, do you have any uh, notion of privacy in this construction? Like, do you want to hide the uh, data collection, or are you just worried about uh, the succinctness of the proofs? So here we only worry about succinctness, and in fact, we have no privacy at all because we reveal the actual elements to the verifier, but uh, I, I believe you can put it in a ZK snark and... Yeah, yeah, I guess that was my question. You, you can compose, yeah. So uh, we talk about it in this paper. It's not possible always. For example, if the weight function cannot be represented as a circuit, then you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. But often you can represent it as a circuit and then you can put the whole thing in the snark and you can make the proof, the proof size even smaller and then you can you get the both the best of both worlds, you get fast prover and small proof, and you, you can also have privacy if you do Z, if you have if you use this ZK snark. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Let's uh, thank Talik one more time, and we'll we'll take our our last break till till four. We got three more talks, so don't bug out of here yet. But grab, grab bathroom, grab water, grab fuel. We'll see you back in about 12, 12 minutes.